Well, amen. Please take your Bibles. If you have them, I invite you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And while you're turning there, let me wrap up uh, our presentation part of the service tonight by sharing just a very quick story. Um, right before we went on deputation, uh, I had breakfast with a pastor whose daughter had just returned from South America from a missions trip. I don't know where in South America she went, but she was in South America, and as she was with her missions team, going from people group to people group, tribe to tribe, basically a man in a particular town, a village, came up to her and said, through an interpreter, is the book you're carrying a Bible? She said, indeed, it is a Bible. And then he said this. He said, um, do you know I have a Bible and would you like to see it? She said, I would love to see your Bible. He went into his home and came out with a folded up piece of cloth, much like a handkerchief, uh, folded up into a little square. He slowly began to unfold that piece of cloth, that piece of material, to reveal on the inside the ripped corner of one page of God's holy word. It had a portion of scripture on one side. It had a portion of scripture on the other side. But that was his Bible. And church family tonight, it was his most prized possession. Do you know that young lady had the wonderful joy and privilege of giving him her Bible? And you can imagine how overwhelmed with joy he, he was. He held that Bible close to his heart, tears streaming down his face. He had been given the, the complete Word of God. He was so excited, so overwhelmed with joy. However... Someone else had joy that day. And it was that young lady God used to give a Bible to someone that did not have it. And I share that story to communicate the joy that we have as God has called us from pastor to missionary to serve with a ministry called Worldview Ministries that is all about giving the Bible to those that do not have it. Now we uh, have a small part in this process, but it is a part nonetheless, and we're excited about the part that God's called us to. I'm not going to be a Bible translator. I sure wish that I had the skills and the education and the background to be a Bible translator, but at age 48, I do not have that, that education and that background. But we will have the joy and privilege to be director of national training, meaning that we will go overseas and we will meet with national pastors and introduce them to the uh, possibility of uh, a Bible translation project in their country and in their people group. And so we're really excited about that opportunity. Plus, in the United States, we'll have the privilege of preaching missions conference after missions conference and raising awareness and raising funds for Bible translation. And so we're really excited about that opportunity. We're on deputation. We just finished year two. We're about 75% of our support. We do covet your prayers. We have a prayer card in the back. But more importantly, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, we, we do want you to pray for us, but don't forget to pray for the ministry of Worldview Ministries. And again, the uh, translation of the Word of God to the unreached people groups of the world. Uh, Pastor, I want you to know, and my wife knows, I, I don't know if I've ever said this publicly, but your excitement for our ministry has been a blessing to us already. And, uh, you know, we um, have found that the majority of churches that we've been in, and we've been in about 160 of them, uh, really people are getting excited about Bible translation. But there have been a few occasions where we've presented our ministry and the pastor just gets up and closes in prayer. And so to see your zeal and enthusiasm for the Word of God just is an encouragement to me. So praise the Lord for that. And I, I'm just so thankful for the privilege of being here uh, tonight. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1. Hebrews 11, verse number 1. I'll be sensitive of time tonight. And I sure appreciate your, uh, your uh, attention. And uh, look at, at verse number 1, Hebrews 11. The Bible says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I'll read that one more time. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Tonight, in the uh, amount of time that we have, I want to look at this thought, this truth from this text, the evidence of faith. The evidence of faith. Now, if you like alliteration, you could call it the birthmarks of belief. Isn't that fancy? But really what we're going to do is look at three observations regarding the evidence of faith from Hebrews 
chapter 11. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege of being in this place and with these dear people. Our hearts have already been encouraged by being here. And uh, Father, we're so thankful for the bright light that this church is, not only in this community, but around the world as they have a heart, uh, an obvious, evident heart for missions. And Father, we just pray now that you would use the power of your word and the power of your spirit to do a spiritual work in our hearts, in our lives, and uh, every marriage represented here tonight, every family represented in this church family, in my life. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you'll do something spiritual so that we, Father, can draw closer to you and bring honor and glory to you by acting like Christ. Father, we um, teach and preach tonight in faith, believing that if we just preach your word without apology, that you can do something great in our midst, and we do ask that this evening. Uh, we pray if there's even one that has the least bit of doubt about their salvation, that tonight they would be saved and turn to Christ. We'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, maybe you've heard this story before. I don't know, but I, I like this story. It's a story told about a sweet little old lady who loved the Lord very much. She was a widow woman, but she uh, had a unique custom. Every morning she would go out on her front porch and she would shout at the top of her lungs, praise the Lord. That's how she began her day. Well, um, a, a few um, years went by and an, an atheist neighbor moved in right next door. And he despised this tradition of this woman. So this woman, imagine this, she would go out on her front porch and shout at the top of her lungs, praise the Lord. And then he would growl back, there ain't no Lord. There ain't no Lord. Well, this went on day in and day out. And uh, one day, this uh, woman fell on some hard times. She ran out of groceries. And so she went out on her front porch and she, she began her day as she always did with a hearty praise the Lord. And then she audibly broke out into prayer. And she said something like this. She said, Lord, you know I need groceries. I'm asking you to provide and I'll thank you in advance for what you're going to do. Amen. That's a pretty good prayer. Well, the next day she woke up, went out on her front porch. Lo and behold, three bags of groceries. That's pretty exciting. And so this lady started jumping up and down and saying not just one praise the Lord, but over and over again, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Well, about the third praise the Lord, that atheist neighbor jumped out from behind a bush. And he said this, Aha, I got you this time. I bought those groceries for you. There ain't no Lord. Well, she got even more excited, started jumping up and down even more, shouting, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and, and praise the Lord. And then she said this, Father, thank you for, for providing the groceries and even making the devil pay for them. Amen. <laughs> now, I know that you know this, but the difference between a believer and a non-believer is belief, right? And if you're here tonight and you're saved, you've taken the greatest step of belief, the greatest step of faith, that you'll ever take, and that is the step of putting your faith and trust in Christ, and Christ alone to save you for all eternity. But wait a second. Just because you've taken that greatest step of faith doesn't mean that you're all done with faith. The Christian life is a life of faith. Not that we have a progressive salvation. Once you're saved, it's a one-time event in your life. But you're not done with faith, for the Christian life is a life of faith. We see that in Hebrews chapter 11. And um, I find in the Gospels, and we won't take the time to look at this, but Jesus spoke of different levels of faith. He talked about those with no faith. He talked about those with little faith. He talked about those with great faith. And that communicates to me that no matter where we are this evening, no matter where I am and no matter where you are in the area of faith, guess what? Are you ready for this? Our faith can be increased. Our faith can grow. Our faith can stretch. Now, I have a question for you tonight. Is there evidence of that in your life? This chapter says a lot and speaks volumes about the evidence of faith. Look at verse number one again. Now, faith is the substance of things, so for the evidence of things not seen. Now, I want to give you a, a little... Um, a little hint about this evidence of faith. This evidence has a name, and we don't always like to talk about this name 
that the evidence is referring to, but here it is. The evidence of faith is often obedience. Now this is what I find in my Christian life. You don't have to, you don't have to agree or you don't have That's to right. answer to see if, if we're alike, but probably we are. Um, we love to talk about faith, but we don't always like to talk about obedience. We like to hear preaching on faith, but we don't always like to hear preaching on obedience. That's at least in my life. However, you cannot separate the two. James says faith without works or faith without action or faith, we could say faith without obedience, is a dead faith. And so you cannot separate the two. We sing it as a, as a child. Obedience is the very best way to show that we believe. We sing it as older children. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. So the evidence of faith is obedience. And when we think about that and we look at Hebrews 11... And we look at all that God required of, uh, of these individuals in the great hall of faith. God required them to do some pretty challenging things. Obeying was not always easy for these people. Just like obeying isn't always easy for us. Let me ask you this question and then we'll get to our, our brief outline tonight. What is it that you know without a shadow of a doubt God wants you to do? And yet it's difficult for you to do. It would take some faith. Now you don't have to answer out loud, but in your heart of hearts, think about and consider that question. I know God wants me to do this. And yet, Brother Bill, that would be so challenging for me. Maybe for someone tonight, it's to get baptized. Maybe for someone else, it's to join the church. Maybe for another, it's to get involved with a certain ministry of the church. You, you say, Brother Bill, I know for quite some time God has wanted me to get involved with a certain ministry of the church, and I have a thousand and one reasons why I do not want to get involved with the ministry or that ministry in the church. It would take some faith. Maybe it's to give to a certain project of the church. Maybe it's to witness to a difficult per person. Maybe it's to forgive someone who has injured or insulted you. I don't know what it is. We can go on and on and on and on. But allow the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. Again, what is it that you know without a shadow of a doubt God wants you to do, and yet it's difficult for you to do? It would take some faith. With that in mind, observe with me tonight three evidences of faith. Number one, sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not logical. Sometimes faith is obeying even though it doesn't always add up up here. Sometimes God requires us to do something that in our mind makes no sense whatsoever. Bible illustration. Look at verse number 7. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. What does that mean? Here's what it means. And you know what it means, but here's what it means. Noah built an ark. Okay, what's an ark? Right? He didn't know what an ark was. Well, an ark is something that you need when there's a flood. Okay, what's a flood? He had never experienced a flood before. He had never observed or seen a flood before. And we would say, well, Noah, a flood is something that takes place when there's a lot of rain. And Noah would say, okay, what is Rain, you get the picture. Sometimes God requires us to do something even though it doesn't always add up on paper. I'll give you a more modern day illustration of this, okay? And um, and pastor didn't ask me to mention this, but I, you have to forgive me. I was a pastor 15 years, and so here's a more modern day illustration of this. Tithing. Tithing is an illustration of this. You say, I would rather build an ark than talk about tithing. I, I understand that. I, I understand where you're coming from. But listen to me. Tithing is, is a perfect illustration of this. Maybe you remember back when you were first saved and someone introduced to you uh, the topic of tithing. It made no sense whatsoever. You scratched your head and you had this thought. If the first check I write is my tithe when I get paid, then at the end of the month I won't have any money left over for this, that, or the other. And guess what? On paper you'd be absolutely correct. But wait, you've just taken faith right out of the picture. 
And we could have testimony tonight, testimony after testimony after testimony after testimony of people that said, you know what, Brother Bill, even though it didn't make sense to me at the time, when I trusted God with my finances and I started tithing, God has blessed my, my finances ever since. Amen or oh my? Amen. Amen. Even though it didn't make sense at the time. Tithing is an illustration of this. By the way, salvation is an illustration of this. To a good majority of the world, Bible salvation makes no sense whatsoever. To the average person on the street, this is Bible salvation. If my good outweighs my bad, I go to heaven. If my bad outweighs my good, I go to hell. And on paper, that makes perfect sense. But guess what? It's not Bible, is it? For by grace are you saved through faith. Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So sometimes faith is obeying and taking the step of obedience even though we haven't figured it all out on paper. By the way, you use this all the time in the non-spiritual world. What do you mean? Well, for example, you go to a doctor that you've never met. He writes you a prescription that you maybe aren't able to read. Forgive me if you're a doctor here tonight. You take that prescription and you give it to a pharmacist that you probably don't even see. And then they give you a chemical compound that you most likely don't understand. And guess what you do? You do the same thing I do. You obey the prescription. Even though you don't have it all figured out. We use this in the non-spiritual world all the time. May God help us to use it in the spiritual world with that in which he has told us to do. Number one, observations regarding the evidence of faith. Number one, sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not logical. Number two, another observation, second observation. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not logical. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. All kinds of illustrations in this text about this. We could talk about Joshua walking around the walls. We know what happens, right? We would say, Joshua, walk around the walls and they'll come a-tumbling down. Well, they have to, right? Because there was a song written about it, and so we know that they just had to come a-tumbling down. Well, Joshua didn't know that. I mean, they're walking around those walls, and, and they're not talking, and, and they're obeying God. Everything God said, even though that had to be a little bit uncomfortable. We could talk about Moses leaving the, the comforts of Egypt to walk around the wilderness for 40 years. We could talk about Gideon and 32,000 men going from 32,000 men down to 300 men. That had to be uncomfortable, especially if you were one of the 300. And yet there's probably no greater illustration in this text, maybe in all of the Bible, than verse number 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up. Isaac. Can you imagine that? I, I could not imagine that. You talk about uncomfortable. Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and offer him as a sacrifice. Offer him as a burnt offering. You talk about uncomfortable. Yes, sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. I remember hearing a story when I was a, a children's pastor about a family that had a horrific, horrible house fire and everyone escaped to the front lawn except for the little boy. He somehow in the, got lost in the shuffle or he went back for something. Anyway, the family got, just got out onto the front lawn only to hear the little boy in the upstairs window calling out to the family. The father went to the bottom of the window and he yelled up and he said, Son, jump and I'll catch you. The little boy replied, he said, Daddy, I can't jump because I can't see you. The smoke was just pouring out of that window. And the father replied this way. He said, son, you may not be able to see me, but I can see you jump and you'll be saved. And the little boy jumped and he was saved. Hmm. Now, I share that story to illustrate this truth. Sometimes, and I think that you would agree with me here, sometimes our step of faith feels like a big old leap in the dark. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Now, I'm so thankful God never requires us to take a leap in the dark. He gives us the light of His Word. He gives us these examples, these examples in the Bible uh, for, our, uh, for our learning and, and for our benefit. And so we, we know that He's not going to ask us to just take a blind leap of faith. But sometimes it's uncomfortable. I remember um, the first time that I preached my first sermon. It was uncomfortable. Maybe you remember the first time 
that you stood and gave a testimony in church. It's uncomfortable. Maybe you remember the first time you wrote that tithe check. Maybe you remember the first time that you handed out that gospel tract. Maybe you remember the first time that you stood before that Sunday school class. There was only a handful of children, but it felt like 5,000 in front of you. You were so scared. Maybe you remember the first time that you stood before a congregation and sang. All I'm simply trying to say is this. Sometimes the step of faith is uncomfortable. May God help us to take the step of obedience, even though it's not always comfortable. Let me share this with you. Growing up, I was um, somewhat shy in front of a crowd. didn't matter if it was a crowd of five or a crowd of 500. I was scared to death to stand before a group and speak. I didn't mind being in skits. I didn't mind, you know, I wasn't shy. I liked to be sociable. I, I enjoyed all of that. But just you get me in on a platform in front of anyone, and I was scared to death. And I, sh I share that to say that, um, for 15 years as a pastor and six years as an associate pastor, one of the most difficult things for me to do personally was this. Are you ready? Hello, my name is Bill, and this is my wife Amy, and we're just out inviting folks to church. Very, that, to this day, that makes me uncomfortable. To this day, that's something that as a pastor I had to make myself do. And you say, Brother Bill, that's me. That describes me. But wait a second. Um, aren't you glad someone stepped out of their comfort zone to share Christ with you? Sure you are. Don't other people in this, in this community, don't they deserve the same opportunity? Sure they do. May God help us to obey and take the step of faith, the step of obedience, even though it's not always comfortable. Another side note before we get to the third point. I believe... What it says, obviously, in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we walk by faith, not by what? Sight. I find in that verse the enemy of faith. What's the enemy of faith? Feelings. I think that's a cute way of remembering it. The opposite or the enemy of faith is feelings. When we don't walk by faith, we walk by sight. We walk by our feelings. Um, and, and I believe that a lot of Christians... Early in their Christian walk, they grow and they stretch and they and they and they do things that are uncomfortable, and yet they reach a point where they can't think of the last uncomfortable thing that they did for the Lord. And, and I think a lot of times it's because we rationalize that which we know God is telling us to do. We choose our wisdom over God's wisdom. We choose rationalization over revelation. I had a lady one time tell me, Pastor, she said, um, I'm not going to be in church anymore. My business is growing and I don't have time for church. And then she said this, you'll like this. She said, but it's okay. I talked to God about it and He said, I'm okay. Well, I know that you all know this. The Holy Spirit of God is never going to tell us to do anything that goes contrary to the Word of God. But you know what she just did? She chose rationalization over revelation. And so I feel the enemy of faith is feelings. And so may we not allow uh, discomfort to keep us from growing in our faith. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not logical. Sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not comfortable. And then third and lastly, sometimes faith is obeying God when it's not desirable. What does that mean? That means this, I just don't want to. Um, in my life, I hate to admit to you that this is often the case. I'm just stubborn enough and hard-hearted enough and stiff-necked enough sometimes that um, I just cross my arms like a little stubborn child and I say, uh-uh, God, I, I just don't want to. And um, you say, Brother Bill, give me an illustration in our text of someone that did this that, 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 that would illustrate this truth that sometimes faith is obeying even though we don't want to. Okay, every person in the great hall of faith is an illustration of this. Why? Because they have something we all have. It's called a will. And when God the Father told these individuals to do something, they had a choice. They could harden their heart and say no, or they could soften their heart and say yes, but mark it down. They would never be in the great hall of faith if they didn't learn to say, not my will, but thine, thine be done. They wouldn't be in the hall of faith if they didn't learn to remove self from the throne of their heart and put the Savior there or the Sovereign there where He rightly deserves to be. 
forgive me for using the Fennel family as a personal illustration. Um, don't worry, I'm not using us as a good illustration. <laughs> I would love to stand before you as the poster child for faith, but it's just not the case. When God started to work in my life about changing ministries, I can't be any more real with you than I, I, I'm about to be and tell you that I did not want to change ministries. In my mind, it was not logical. It was not comfortable. And it was not desirable for many, many, many weeks. I won't tell you how many. First of all, it wasn't logical. In my mind, it wasn't logical to resign from a church that I think I could have retired from. That didn't make any sense. It wasn't logical. This doesn't make any sense. We just built a new building and we had just... Uh, uh, you know, entered the building and we're just enjoying this new building and then the Lord says it's time for you to move on to another ministry. That didn't make any sense at all. That was not logical in my mind. Secondly, it wasn't comfortable. I, I, I've, I've already told you, I've already told you and, and, and communicated to you that we love our church family and it was very uncomfortable to say goodbye to them as their pastor. That was a very uncomfortable thing to do. Um, for 15 years, I'll share this with you. For 15 years, I had the wonderful joy and privilege to watch my church family love on my family. And uh, what a joy that was. I often jokingly say, I don't think they care too much for me, but they sure love my family. And as a husband, as a father, as um, you know, a pastor, that brought great joy to me. And so it was very uncomfortable to say goodbye to that. Still uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable to say goodbye if I can be as real as I possibly can with you tonight. It was very difficult to say goodbye to a paycheck. Um, here I had a church family that's taking good care of us as a, as a family. And I remember two years ago, August, I remember get, receiving my last paycheck. And here I am receiving my last paycheck. And now at age 47, I am jumping into deputation for the very first time in my life with a family of seven and a boy in college at the time. Uh, now I have two. And I thought, Lord, I'm doing the dumbest thing that I could ever do, ever. This isn't going to fly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bankrupt our whole family. I was scared to death. Scared to death. It wasn't logical. It wasn't comfortable. And then lastly, it wasn't desirable. I, I would argue with the Lord and I would say, Lord, I don't want to, but I'll be a pastor of another church if that's what you want. The Lord said, no, that's not what I want. I would argue with the Lord and I would say, Lord, I will work in a Bible college, though I don't want to. I will if that's what you want me to do. And God said, no, that's not what I want you to do. I would argue with the Lord and I would say, Lord, allow me please to be a church planting mi missionary where I could still be a pastor. And the Lord said, no, I want you to serve with Worldview Ministries, almost 4,000 people groups without a Bible. I want you to go from church to church, missions conference to missions conference, raise awareness, raise funds for Bible translation. And I remember the day that I made the decision to take that step, that step of obedience, that step of faith. I was sitting in my office, it was during the summer, and I received an email from one of our missionaries in the Philippines, a missionary that we supported, and at the end of his mission letter, his newsletter, his prayer letter, he wrote these words. And it was as if God was speaking them just to me. He said this, he wrote this, If you are considering God's calling to foreign missions, do not fear. We can boldly say with the Apostle Paul, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. And I remember thinking, okay God, I get the picture. And I remember we took that step of faith, that step of obedience. It felt like a big old leap in the dark, but we took that step. And here's the point, and we'll wrap this up. God has blessed our family ever since. Ever since we took that step of faith, God has provided every need and then some. God has blessed us. God has taken care of us. God has protected us. God has provided for us. No bills have gone unpaid. I remember thinking uh, at, at age 47, Pastor, I would look at new missionaries coming out, coming out of Bible college and I would envy them because they didn't have a mortgage payment and all of the things that came with that, you know. And I had all of that. And, and, and yet, two years later, 
God has provided every step of the way. And He's paid every, though God has taken care of it. But church family, God tells us in His Word that He will do that. Look at verse number 6. But without faith, it's impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now there's a lot of TV evangelists that will tell you and teach you that that is some sort of cotton candy Christianity where if you have enough faith, you'll have a million dollars in the bank, you'll never get sick. That's just absolutely not true. That's not what verse 6 is teaching. Verse 6 is simply teaching this truth that God is pleased when His children obey. That's it. God is pleased when His children take the step of obedience. God is pleased. Verse number 6 has been a real blessing to the Fennel family as we've made transition from pastor to missionary. And one of the truths of, of verse number 6 that have, has been a blessing to us is this truth that God can bless us better than we can bless ourselves. We know that, don't we? Yeah. We need to be reminded of that, though, don't we? We know it's true, but we need to be reminded of that truth, that God can bless me a whole lot better than I can bless myself. Years ago, we were having dinner around the table on Saturday night, and uh, there was a bag of potato chips on the table. And my third son, Chad, was about Cooper's age. He was just a little guy. And he interrupted Amy and I. Amy and I were talking, and he interrupted. And he said, Daddy, may I have some potato chips? And I said, sure, son, go ahead, take some chips. And then I kept talking to Amy. Well, I didn't know this, but he didn't take any chips. So a few minutes later, he interrupted a second time. And he said, Daddy, may I have some potato chips? And I said, sure, son, go ahead, take some. And I kept talking to Amy, and he didn't take any chips. I didn't know that, but he didn't take any chips. A few minutes later, he interrupted three times. The third time. Now, dads out there, you know we only have so much patience. Uh -huh. And when you're interrupted the third time, you start having evil thoughts. Like, I'm going to feed this kid a chip with a, you know, with, with a slingshot. You know, you're just going to, I'm going to give him a potato chip, right? And so you have evil thoughts like that. But, but I said, son, what? Take a potato chip. He interrupted the third time. Daddy, may I have a potato chip? Yes, take some potato chips. I took the bag and I moved it over uh, in front of him. And then he said this, and I'll never forget it because it's a spiritual truth that we all need to be reminded of. He said this, he said, no, daddy, you do it. Your hand is bigger than my hand. And it was a reminder to me, and it should be a reminder to all of us, that my Heavenly Father and your Heavenly Father has a bigger hand than we have. And that God can bless us a whole lot better, a whole lot more than we can bless ourselves. But wait, we need to be in the place of blessing. We need to be in the place of obedience. And so I end where I began. What is it that you know God wants you to do and yet it's difficult for you to do? it would require some faith. May God give us the humility and the courage to do what we know God wants us to do. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house tonight with these dear people. We thank you, Father, for your word and the privilege that we have in this country to have your word. And Father, I pray, Lord, whatever you are working on people's lives to do, uh, I pray that you will give them the, the humility and the courage to do what they know is right to do. Uh, and take that step of faith, that step of obedience, Father, to uh, reveal the evidence of our faith. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Amen. Well, a question was asked, what is it that God's asked you to do that He knows you want you to do that it would take faith for you to do? And anytime there's a specific question like that, uh, God takes the heart of a person and he says you know what I'm talking about and he deals with you very very directly and if God's dealt with you this evening we'd be remiss not to take a moment not to take enough time to say I'll do it Lord I'll do it uh, this evening I would not endeavor to plant into anybody's mind what it is that God wants you to do I, I, I have a small vision compared to God 
if I were to go around the room and I would just pick each person or pick each person and say, this is what God wants you to do. I try to look at you and your capabilities and uh, what the needs of our little ministry are. We have a big God who wants you to do something with His abilities, with His vision, the way that He sees things. And uh, yeah, that takes faith. Amen. And God knows what He has spoken to you about, and you know what God's spoken to you about. And so let's take a little bit of time of invitation this evening. Uh, we're going to open our hymn books up, and we're going to sing, I'll go where you want me to go. We'll be keeping in mind Abraham tonight, page 440. And as we sing, when we begin to sing tonight, let's be honest about it. If we're singing the words, but God said, I want you to go, and I want you to, and your answer is, that is not what I meant. <laughs> That's not, no. Uh, let's sing the words if they're true. And if they're not true, then God's given you something that He simply wants you to trust Him for. Okay, so page 440. If you're physically able to do so tonight, we'll stand. And, and then as soon as we begin to sing, if you're not ready to sing those words yet, you can just take a seat right where you're at or, or kneel or uh, go back or go forward, find a place, do business with God here tonight so that when we leave tonight, you will have settled with God. I will. Yes, Lord. Go where you want me to go out. I'll do what you want me to do. And so we'll begin singing now. And you just right away, you just do business with the Lord.